Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ohio Huntsman Podcast, and this is an interesting one. We talked to Mark Stuckbauer about natural cover scent. So we're all trying to beat a deer's nose, right? Try to not get scented. Play the wind is obviously the best choice, but as we all know, the wind does squirrely stuff, right? The wind swirls, it it isn't what the forecast was, whatever the case may be, we all, or, you know, probably more commonly, the deer come from a direction that you didn't expect. And so we're always trying to find a way to cover our scent, minimize our scent so that we can, um, I don't want to say beat a deer's nose, but, but maybe give us those, those vital seconds in order to get a shot off or make a good shot, good ethical shot. And so we talk about natural options that are, you know, out, out in nature, hence natural, um, that you can use to cover your scent. And interestingly enough, we mentioned this topic to our dad after we recorded it. And he told us, oh yeah, when, when I'm bow hunting, I always take a handful of dirt and cause he hunts from the ground a lot almost primarily, he said, I always take a handful of dirt and rub it on the tree that I'm standing by as a natural cover scent. And we talk about using dirt as a cover scent in this episode. So really interesting topic. It's it's not one that we've covered before. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it and, and get something out of it. Before we talk about that, though, I want to talk about our sponsor, Mastin's Deer Sense. They are... I consider them a premium scent company. They collect their scent on stainless steel. A lot of the other companies collect on concrete. And so you're getting clean, nice scent. And they've got options. It's not just a bottle of liquid scent, right? It's different flavors. So you've got Smell Like a Deer, which is another great cover scent if you will I mean you wouldn't want to spray it on yourself but you could spray it in the area it's sort of I guess natural right because it comes from a deer Um, so kind of I guess fitting for the episode they've got obviously your full estrus they've got a scent called buck reaper a lot of different scents and then in addition to their liquid scents they have scented candles deer scented candles or like an apple scented candle as well as scented gel crystals. And those, the, the candles, can be used in their double scent stacker. So you can, it allows you to layer scents, to have a scented candle and a liquid scent in the warming tray above it. So a lot of options. Now is the time of year where we've had, where we typically have the most luck with scents. And so if you're interested in that, if that sounds like something you want to try this year, check them out mastinsdeersense.com there'll be a link in the description to find their website and you can order right from the website and have it shipped to your house and with that let's get into the episode welcome to the ohio huntsman podcast where three brothers jason jacob and jeff discuss all things hunting in ohio our goal is to be your source for accurate and reliable hunting news and conservation issues in the great state of ohio as well as some fun and interesting conversations along the way. This is the Ohio Huntsman Podcast. Are you listening? All right, so today on the podcast, we've got Mark Stuckbauer, and this is something that we've not covered on the podcast yet, which is what intrigued me when Mark approached us about this. And so we're going to talk about scent control which we're all you know we're all aware of uh scent control today but in particular mark has some interesting things he does for natural scent control or natural scent or or, uh natural cover scent so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today but i guess before we get into that mark um first i want to thank you for taking time to come on the show and talk to us it's my pleasure yeah, and if you could, could you kind of give us a little bit of your your history, how you got into hunting? You know, did you grow up hunting, or kind of give us a little bit of your your background? All right. Um, well, I'm in Northeast Ohio, Geauga County, where the uh, 
the heart of the snow belt out here, we get about 160 inches of snow a year, just for a reference point. Um, <laughs> just a little bit of snow, you know, here. And there. Yeah, just a touch. Yeah. Um, I basically started hunting when I was 13 years old. Um, a dear friend of mine, pretty much my brother, I call him, uh, him and his father and his uncles and all the old timers started basically just taking us kids out. Now, he had always hunted, but, you know, being a good friend, he's like, come on out. You got to check this out. Got to try it out. And typical, you know, young kid getting into the woods hunting. Of course, you don't see anything or shoot anything for the first couple of years. Sure. And, um, but just being out in the woods and, and seeing deer up close and, you know, the turkeys and the owls and everything like that, it just, it was so cool. I loved it. To this day, I still love it. And uh, that's basically how I got started. My family didn't hunt. Um, my other side of my family, my father's family did hunt, but they were quite a bit older. But my father did not hunt, and uh, we shot guns and whatnot. But we never really got into the hunting aspect of, of any sort to be honest. And uh, it wasn't until I was, you know, 13, 14 years old that I first got introduced to it. And it's been a, uh, a downfall ever since. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So like I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about natural cover scent. So mm -hmm. how long have you been using this and, and sort of how did you discover this or, or what set you on this path of, of natural cover scent? Okay. So well, I'm 46 years old, so you can do the math that I've been hunting for a couple of years. Yeah. Well before scent lack and hunter specialties and, you know, all this, that and the other. But what I did is in high school, I read a book and it was a it was a book. I forget the name of it. I should actually do some research on it. But it was a book on how the Native Americans, the Indians hunted because obviously they didn't, you know, they had a stick and an arrow. That was it. And uh, I just kind of listened, you know, read the book and jotted down a bunch of information and just kind of started applying it like you know paying attention to your wind obviously that's a crucial element that everybody needs to pay attention to but also using natural cover as your cover sets um you know whether it be the golden rod the oak leaves maple leaves beech leaves the thistle it doesn't matter any any and all plant material out there in the woods has oils and resins and that's kind of stuff in it and when you smash it or crush it up in your hands or your boots or whatever it may be, it emits an, an odor. And some of it's nice. Skunk cabbage is not nice. I mean, we all know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but skunk cabbage is a wonderful example. Um, where I hunt up here in the swamp, I hunt the park district up here, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I have 136-acre lakes that I take a little eight-foot john boat across, and uh, – I go up into the back of the swamp. So being on the swamp, there's a lot of skunk cabbage. So anybody that's ever stepped on skunk cabbage, you know how aromatic, if you want to use that term, it is. Yep. <laughs> fragrant. I don't even know if you want to call it fragrant, but it stinks. Yes. But with that being said, if you step on one little sprig of that coming out of the ground, and I don't know if it's a tuber or a rhizome or a bulb, I'm not exactly sure. But if you step on that and it grows all year round, if you step on it, it emits that smell. Well, if you have that around your around your area that you're hunting, you just added an immense smell to that area. And it, it just helps you know, disguise your cover, your scent that you are emitting. Whether it be, you know, you can do everything you want in the world. You're not going to beat a deer's nose. But you can sure try. And the, right. results, the results have been priceless. The, like I said, that video I sent you this morning. That buck was completely downwind of me, and you could watch the leaves falling from me to it. And he looked up at me. <clears throat> you know, I'm a big blob in, in a tree, but he really didn't do anything about it. You know, he yeah. was completely, relatively content. Yeah, and and so yeah. I guess with any kind of scent, scent, scent elimination, scent cover scent, right? Mm -hmm. And and I don't know the science of it, right? But my my take on it is, like you said, you're never gonna beat a deer's nose but if it buys you those extra couple seconds or you know the does that walk by first don't freak out because they caught a face full of your scent and it allows you to get a shot at the the buck following them or you know like that's where i find the benefit of of scent control and and cover scent comes in right correct i know i'm not going to 
beat a deer's nose, right? I'm just not. But if I can do these little things, right, to kind of tip the odds ever so slightly in, in my favor, then one, it makes me more confident in the woods, which I think plays a big role in, in being successful. And it, you know, a lot of times it makes for a, a more interesting hunt. So going back to, you know, you, you mentioned you read a book about the Native Americans that that intrigues me, right? Because a lot of times I'm I'm hunting and it's like, man, I've got all this stuff, right? I've got a GPS on my phone and, you know, new age bow and, you know, all this stuff, technology, trail cameras. And I still struggle to get this done. Whereas, you know, people have been hunting for years and years and years, right? So what were they using? And so when you, when you mentioned these natural cover scents, I thought, huh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting topic. So it's a tool. It's, I mean, that's kind of how I apply it. <clears throat> I look at it as just another tool in my arsenal. And like you said, I like that. I like that. <clears throat> you can have the best bow and, you know, this, that, and the other, but it comes down to the basics. And that's the, the deer's nose. Now, like you just mentioned about the being comfortable going into the woods, you're 100% right. If, if that is one of the top things you have to be able to do and applying it the way that I do, it gives me a comfort level. I mean, like I said, those bucks were completely downwind of me today. Right. I could have I could have shot three different bucks this morning. I have video of them all within 18 yards, but I decided not to because they're going to be beautiful deer in the next couple of years. But uh, you know, getting that native scent up into your your uh, base of your airfoil where your you know the wind's coming by you and whatnot. If they smell goldenrod, which is probably my favorite thing that I use, and it grows all across the Midwest, it uh, starts flowering in September. It's a bright yellow flower, <clears throat> and it has a citrus smell to it. I take two or three sprigs of that as I'm just walking through the edge of the swamp. It doesn't grow in water, but it'll grow right next to water to you know, sand and prairie lands and everything else. But I take two or three sprigs of that, put it in my pocket as I'm climbing up in my stand, put on your safety harness first. And then once I get it prepared, I'm ready up there. I take that out of my pocket, and I literally just smash it up in my hands just a couple times. And I'll put it in my pocket, or I'll hang it on the tree, or I'll even tuck it into my, my tree stand. So now I have okay. created that volume of natural scent up there where, where the winds are coming through me. That's incorporated right into that. And right. it's just proven itself so many times. Like, to be honest with you, is right to play the wind success yes you're gonna have better success if you play the wind more my time is limited i have a young son i don't really play the wind that much to be honest with you now during the rut i do it even less because the bucks don't really pay attention plus i'm hiding a swamp right okay <laughs> and you know another thing that i do and i don't know if i mentioned this to you or not if you guys turkey hunt or not you sit up against the base of a tree the dirt that surrounds the base of that tree is always a lot more uh, kind of, not loamy, but it's a lot more aromatic, like extreme, okay. but it's also a lot more loose. So if you were just, when you get up to your tree stand, before you climb up, whether you're using a climber or even a ground blind for that matter, trees surrounding you, kick the dirt around the base of those trees. And you'll be amazed at how close that resembles the the scent wafers, the fresh earth scent wafers and the cover. Oh, okay. It literally mimics it. There's no exaggeration to it. So again, all that's doing is just, that's just incorporating your, the natural scent in the woods, but you're just multiplying it by, by opening up that soil or smashing that plant and putting that up in your air with you. Sure. It, it, it just proves itself time and time and time and time again. I want to pause here for a quick second and I, I promise it'll be quick. You may or may not know we have Ohio Huntsman apparel. We also have Ohio Huntsman decals. So if that's something you're looking for, if you're looking for a new sweatshirt or something, or you're starting to think about Christmas shopping, please check that out. It helps support the show. And uh, I think it would be cool to, to see one of you guys out there rocking an Ohio Huntsman sweatshirt or t-shirt or something, or, or see a decal on your truck or something like that. So Go to ohiohuntsman.com slash apparel and check that stuff out. So when you're, I guess, kind of from a, from a, 
a tactical standpoint. So you've got these sprigs of say goldenrod and, and you've taken them up and you got up there and you got set and you kind of smashed them up or, you know, you tucked them into your tree stand throughout the hunt. Do you, do you need to refresh that at all? Or once you've got it going, it's good. Well, I mean, let's face it. When we're all in the tree stand, we're either looking at the woods, looking at our phone or trying to stay awake. So for me, it's, I'll put it up in a tree and I'll just grab it and I'll just smash up my hand for two seconds. Or if it's okay. in the tree stand, you know, I'll take it back out and I'll just smash it in my hands. It gives you something to do on top of it. But literally the stuff will last a 24 hour period, especially okay. the world rod because it has a lot of oil in it. And when you smash that up, you smell your hands and it literally smells citrusy. It's, it's actually kind of a nice fragrance in my opinion. Women should start okay. wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, you, you mentioned the dirt you mentioned the goldenrod is there any other uh plants or things that you like to use as a as a natural cover scent <clears throat> as a natural cover scent well like i said any type of foil foliage out there um they all have oils and resins in them now, granted, if you grab pine branches and you start smashing up in your hands, you're going to have sticky hands, basically. Yeah. The resins uh, from the sap, actually. Um, but anything out there, just just get it. Put it in your hands and run it through. I don't care if it's hemlocks or river birch or, you know, maple oak beach. You know, it all emits some type of a scent. And it's just incorporate Again, it, there's, that just incorporates that into your air, you know, surrounding you. Another big thing that I'm a, I'm a big advocate of um, of preparing your clothing and your gear. Okay. You, you have to you have to do that. I have friends that smoke in the tree stands and they wonder why they don't get you know big deer every year. And I have friends that don't wash their clothes and they they wonder why they're not seeing the deer. And it all comes down to you know again it's a tool, but it comes down to preparation you know, all the way across. And with everything that you do, you have to prepare for it. I mean, you're beating, you're trying to beat Mother Nature. Right. Mm -hmm. So well, I'm assuming you do this. One thing I do when I'm in the woods is I'm always asking why, right? Why did that deer do that? Why did that squirrel do that? Why is that plant growing there? Or you know, you see a deer, you watch a deer browsing on something. Well, what, what exactly is he browsing on, right? He's over there eating, but what, what exactly is he over there eating? Right. And I think that just plays into just, just being better in the woods, having a sense of what's going around, around what's going on around you in the woods. And so can you give us any tips in that regard as far as just being a better outdoorsman, being a better woodsman. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it should be, they should literally, in my opinion, they should start teaching this to children that want to get into the outdoors, whether it be hunting, fishing, trapping, or just playing with the, you know, in the woods, they should teach children how to uh, basically look at the woods. I mean, yeah, they're just trees and their leaves and their swamp and water and whatnot, but it's so much more than that. Um, you know, one of the things that I do is I rely on my ears more than my vision. I'm constantly, I, I'm almost like an owl when I'm in the tree stand. I'm constantly looking and listening. Okay. But if, I hear, if I hear something snap, I'll wait five minutes in that general area. I will focus on that area for five minutes. If I hear squirrels and chipmunks going crazy, well, the first thing I do is look up to find out where the hawk or the eagle is. If not, right. up here we have a there's uh, I think four eagles on this lake that I hunt. See them okay. every time it's beautiful. But um, you know, I pay attention to what all the other animals are doing out there. If they start going crazy, then you know something's wrong. Now, when these bucks came in this morning, I swear I had never seen that many different types of birds all in one time in one area, directly on the ground around them. And I've never experienced that before. I've never really seen that before. And I don't know what that means or what why that happened. Yeah, you know, it's it's just paying attention to to nature. It's like you said, what are they browsing on and why? Well, I mean, food sources. 
you know, yeah. everything, you know, these deer didn't come in today. I think it was just about a little bit after nine o'clock, which is oh, a little okay. bit late. You know, you typically you think deer are feeding during the night and they're just browsing their way back to the bedding area. Well, the bedding area from where I'm at, that's it's probably I don't know, eight nine hundred yards away. It's a good distance away. Sure. And, you know, they weren't. You know, they were. That's where they were going, but they were just browsing along. But as far as be, being a better woodsman, it all comes down to the ability to get out there. Now, I understand, you know, it's hard for some children to get out there. And it's hard for adults to get out there with schedules and family and work and practice and all this, that, and the other. But yep. one thing that I do is I get out there. I went for a walk last night, took my camera equipment and binoculars. And I went out there and I wasn't looking for deer. I just took, took the old trail. And I was just relaxing, but paying attention to what I saw a couple turkeys, watching what they were doing, watching where they were going. And what that led me to do was just get some great pictures of them on top of everything. But being a, a woodsman, how can I say this the, the polite way? You can be a hunter. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a, a new day hunter, a new age hunter, or you can be a hunter slash woodsman. And to me, the, they both have a value. Don't get me wrong. But the true value is somebody that can go out there and can understand nature, can appreciate nature, and take it for what it's worth. I mean, this is God's creation that we're, we're looking at and that we're involved in. Yeah. And it's, you know, looking at the deer tracks, looking at the deer signs, scrapes and rubs. You know, I'm seeing them places where I'm not even looking for them. But when you see it, it's like, oh, man, that is so cool. And I've seen thousands of them. But it's, it's right. never dull. It's never a dull moment. And uh, I know I got a little bit off track there. No, that's, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> but it's, it's not just during hunting season. You know, I'm always outside. My son, fortunate enough for me, I have a young son that loves everything that I do. And usually we're outside. We go hiking, camping, fishing, hunting, you know, all that different stuff. But it's, you know, for children's sake, it's getting them outside, just take them for a walk. It, it can be on a trail. It doesn't have to be on a trail, though. I like path of least resistance as much as anybody. But yeah. I'd much rather find the path that nobody else has traveled. Because you see things out there you can't, you know, you don't see in pictures. You won't experience in a video. It's just getting out there and just letting, you know, a child experience that stuff. An adult. I mean, I love seeing that kind of stuff. I've seen rock formations. There's a tree back here. This is no joke. It says, survived tornado July 4th weekend, 1969. It's an enormous beech tree. We had a huge tornado come through here July 4th weekend in 1969. Okay. And somebody carved that into it. Well, it's nowhere near a trail. It was just doing a little bit of exploring. And, and that was it. Yeah. 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 You, you know, you mentioned the, you know, taking kids out there and, and that's one thing that's been really cool for me with having a young daughter, right. Is things that I've walked past forever and never thought much of it. She's now, you know, well, what's that? And it's like, it's, it's sort of, uh, forced me, I guess, to, I, I don't know what that is, I'm, but I'm going to try and find out now because, you know, she's asked the question and, and now it's piqued both of our curiosity. And so it's it's helped me learn more plants and, and things like that when we're outside together, you know, that so that's been a sort of, uh, I guess, an unexpected benefit of, of having a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you want to see a kid excited. Show them a frog, show them a salamander, show them a raccoon or a coyote track, and, but yeah. be able to explain that to them. You know, this is what it is, and this is this might be why it's going in this general direction. You know, yeah. kids, I mean, I can only only speak of my son. You know, that's the only child that I have. It's my only experience with showing a young child, you know, what the outdoors is about. But it takes such little effort to spark their interest in almost anything. It really does. I mean, he has a collection. I have a bucket in the garage with 11 woolly bears in it. And we feed, <laughs> we, we feed them every day. They eat grass. That's what we feed them. But they're mm -hmm. like his pets. I have a little pond right next to my deck. We have a bunch of goldfish and koi in it. 
Well, all summer long, there's three to four, fro- maybe sometimes even five frogs in there. Yeah. And it'll be out there every single day trying to catch them. But it's <laughs> it's keeping them outside. It's keeping them off the electronics. It's showing them, you know, yeah, it, it's a frog. One day it can get big and they'll taste great. But, <laughs> you know, that's it. You know, in a way, it's his pets, and he does it every single day. He wants right. to bring it inside, and I have to say no, obviously. <laughs> right. Yeah. Got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But being a woodsman, I mean, it, it comes down to, and I can't stress this enough, it comes down to, and again, I don't care if you're a child or an adult, it's making that time. And time is a sacrifice for all of us. We all understand that and, and get it. But it's making that sacrifice to go out and try to make yourself, and it doesn't have to be hunting. It doesn't. If you want to go for a hike with a cup of coffee, it helps. There's not a single person that comes back more stressed out after a hike. And, and you know, that's the truth. Yeah, people relax. It's it's about just, you know, you don't have to go for a run. You don't have to go for a walk. You don't have to do anything. But if you can get out there and just look at the sky, look at the clouds, listen to the birds, watch the turkey, you know, check out a weird track you've never seen and try to dissect it, see what it is. You yeah, know, it's it's just so much more than than just about the hunting. It is. And hunting is my life. And don't get me wrong. But when, during hunting season, that's what I'm doing. When it's not hunting season, I'm looking for deer sheds. I'm looking for bedding areas. I'm looking at new properties. But we're out there exploring and appreciating what it is. Yeah, that's one of the the benefits of hunting for me, right, is it it gives me a reason to be out in nature, right? Because I, I feel like if I, if I wasn't a hunter, right, then if for some other reason, you've got to sort of prioritize being outside and... I can see how if there's not an activity that you do and and you cherish and, you know, you wait all year for it to come back around, um, it's easy to just live inside, right? And so being a hunter forces me to be outside and and sort of get that that, uh, outside therapy, if you will, right? Just being out in nature. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially this time of the year. I mean, the leaves are changing like crazy up here. It's it's beautiful. I mean, I'm looking at the tops of the trees right now, and they're just golden from the sunlight dropping. Yeah. And just experiencing little things like that. It's it's immense. And I yeah. have many friends and family that, you know, my family doesn't like hunting. They don't like the, the theory and the you know everything that goes along with it that I hunt. But they understand that it's who I am, and it's what makes me happy. I mean, granted, we all know it's not cheap. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. It could be, but none of us decide to make it cheap. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't get the questions from anybody. Like, you know, why do you hunt? Why do you harvest an animal? I used to, but people just know now. They're like, you know, that's just, that's Stucky. That's what he does. That's what him and all his friends do. And they're, the reason behind it is they know that I'm cooking steaks, I'm cooking burgers, chili, venison, squirrel kebabs, whatever it may be. But that's yeah. that's the value. That's the end value. Being able to harvest something and process it and eat it, take care of it yourself. To me, that's a yeah. great gift. It really is. It's a great gift, and I'm more than glad that I get to do this and appreciate it. Yeah. I want to pause here and talk about our sponsor, Monster Whitetail Grub. So, they are an Ohio deer feed company. They source everything from Ohio, even even their packaging. So their ingredients, their packaging. They try to get it all from Ohio. So it helps support the show, which is great, but it also helps support the Ohio economy, which is even better, and you get a great product out of it. So if deer feed is something that you're you're looking for or looking to supplement with or use as an attractant to hunt over, I encourage you to check them out. They also have straight mineral if that's something you're interested in. So check them out. Like I said, it supports us. It allows us to continue to make make these episodes and, and bring you this content. And it supports the Ohio economy. So with that, let's get back to the conversation. Jake, Jeff, you guys have questions for Mark? Yeah, yeah. So you talked earlier about preparing your your stuff, your clothes before the hunt. Yes, sir. Um, 
Now, are you using a commercial product to wash your clothes with, or what are you doing to prepare your stuff? Yeah, so I've used pretty much, I mean, like everybody, I've tried, you know, pretty much everything out there. I'm a big advocate of Hunter Specialties, whether it be their soaps, their uh, body wash, their wafers, their cover scents. You know, again, I've tried it all, and I've had great results with them. Um, so so here's what I, I'm going to give you just a quick little spiel of how I do it. So if I know I'm hunting tomorrow morning, which I was, I'm not, but if I was, I would spray down all my stuff right now. And I would put it, I have a spare bedroom that's, we call it our hunting room. That's where all our hunting stuff is. And I have a little ozone generator in there. And I keep that going for three hours. That's the button. And, but what I do is I put everything in there and I hung a string from one door to the other, from the closet door to the, uh, to the other door. And what I do is I hang up all my clothes on there. I turn the fan, the ceiling fan on high and I spray everything down with net, with, uh, uh, what do they call it? The natural earth. I spray it down with that. And so apply it and dry it. That's, that's you know, one of the themes out there. So I'll spray it okay. down and I'll let it dry. I get up in the morning. First thing I do is I spray that stuff again. I get up about an hour before I have to be out, be heading out. Spray it down real quick, mist it, and let it dry one more time. Now keep in mind, I've already sprayed the inside of my boots also, as well as the outside of my boots. So jump in the shower, you know, I make sure that I have a towel and a washcloth that have already been through the washer and dryer on a, you know, using the soaps and I've also sprayed them down. So I get out of the shower, dry myself off with a towel that's already been treated and have my hunting clothes. I get ready. I don't touch my dog. I don't touch anything from the time I leave the bathroom to the time I get to my truck and I get in my truck hit and jump in the boat, drop the boat in the water, jump in the boat, go across the lake. Right when I get to the shoreline up in the river, I spray down one more time, and then that's it. Okay. That's it. But when I get home, the end of the day, everything goes back up on that line in the spare bedroom and gets sprayed one time. Okay. And that's it. It, it's simple. Mm-hmm. I do use scent lock. Okay. I, I'm an enormous advocate of scent lock. I've just like you guys. You know, we started off, you know, with just regular tree bark, mossy oak, tree bark camouflage. You know, that's all we had back in the day. If it wasn't brown you know, brown pants and a flannel shirt in the early right. days. But if scent lock gives me 0.5% better opportunity to be scent free, in my opinion, it's worth it. And that's kind of how I look at it. And it's proven. So, so this, this reminded me, Jeff, because you had talked, and I don't know how I didn't think of this before, but you have made some, I guess they would be natural cover scents as well, where you took, I think you said you took pine needles and just boiled them down and sort of turned that into a, a, a concentrate that you, you then put in a spray bottle. Is that right? Yeah, I've done it with pine needles and I've done it with sassafras leaves. Okay. And it, it seems to work pretty well. You know, I, I mean, I can't guarantee that it works, but it, it makes me feel like I'm smelling more natural. So. Yeah. And it does work. You know, again, you're 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 creating that that scent comb up there, and you're just taking the natural habitat and you're applying it to yourself. You know, downwind, that's what they're catching. Right? right. They're smelling. The genius idea. There's actually a couple companies. I looked into this. There are a couple companies that make natural scent control. And uh, I mean, in this industry, it's very extremely hard to get anything started. We all know that by now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, so but yeah, it's, anything like that you can do is a plus. Yeah, because do you ever do you ever worry about like taking a a scent from you know a scent that isn't natural in that area and bringing it and like alerting the deer? Like say you take pine scent, and you know you rub yourself in in pine needles, and then you go into the woods where there is no pine trees. Do you ever worry that that different scent being in the area is going to alert deer? Yes, completely. Um, the same with apples. Listen, and with apples, that's another thing you can do. Um, you can take apple and crush that up in your in your deer stand, and that also helps if you have apples in your area. There is no sense in taking some cedar sprigs and breaking them up if you don't have any cedars growing around you for a mile. Doesn't make sense. 
So I completely agree with that. Use okay. your, use your vegetation that's surrounding you, and that's why I pick as I go. As I'm walking through, you know, it's pitch dark. I got my headlamp going. I know what goldenrod looks like. I know what apple looks like. I know what everything looks like. I just grab a couple handfuls, like I said, just throw them in my pockets real quick. But yeah, you don't want to, you know, order something online and decide to bring it home and have it shipped and then try that. I don't recommend. Mm-hmm. That. Okay. All right. But yeah, you Jake, use your surroundings. Yeah, because uh, that's one thing. Like. Uh, I guess in that same vein, right, there's there's the nose jammer product, yeah. which I think the way that is intended to work is it, it's it's not a natural scent, but it's intended, as the name implies, right, to sort of overwhelm the deer's olfactory system. And, you know, and it picks up that scent and sort of ignores or or can't distinguish the human scent. And I'm not entirely sure of the specifics, but I've always been hesitant on that because it's not a it's not a natural scent. It's not a naturally occurring scent. Correct. But I guess uh, I guess if uh, until deer start to associate that scent with danger, maybe maybe that's how it works. Right. And that's a matter of time. I mean, 20 some years ago, and you can ask the old timers, deer didn't look up in a tree. Right. And through, you know, evolution, you know, deer are starting to look up in the trees a lot more than what they've ever had. And which is fine because I'll wave to them or I'll take a nice picture of them. And have, ask them to <laughs> <smile real quick. laughs> but, you know, you, you, you have to pay attention to your surroundings. There's so many products on the market. And I've done the ATA shows. I've been to all the sportsman shows. I've done them. I've seen them. I've, I've seen every kind of gag gift out there you can imagine. It just comes down to paying attention to your surroundings. Right. You know, no, like I said, there's no point in getting red pine or cedar wafers when it doesn't even ex- grow in your area. Yeah. And, uh, and there's all these, you know, one of the questions that I've always wondered about, kind of the same thing, is you can buy all these torso glands and this fresh, uh, you know, dopey and all that. Where's that deer from? Because a deer that's in Missouri is dip- eating and drinking different stuff than they are here in Ohio. And I've always wondered if deer would be able to sense that and pick up on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. I, I would... I would venture to, I mean, just from anecdotal evidence for myself, I think personally, I think deer can pick up, especially on the big name, you know, the big name urine companies mm-hmm. where everyone in America is using the same scent. Right. I can't help but imagine that the deer know that that's not right. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. smell like the rest of them. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I'm not a big advocate, a big fan of using uh, like Donestris and, you know, buck this and buck that. I'm not a big fan of using it just because the results have been relatively minimal for me. But in a way, I've already patterned the deer. I know come the, you know, come the rut. So here's here's one tidbit of information that I've been telling a lot of people lately because it's been through years of experience. Up here around November 8th through the 13th is our rut. Now, keep in mind, I've gotten the last three bucks between the ninth, uh, the ninth and the tenth of November. Two of them on the tenth. So I sit in the, you know, again, I already gave you the scenario. I go all the way back to the swamp. The swamp, once the we start getting the fall rains and the water rises on the lake, that swamp will be about a foot to two foot deep of water. I have watched year after year after year those being chased, and they all run into that swamp. Two bucks chase them at a time. I, I have seen it all. But they run into that swamp for a purpose, and that is as they're running through the water, that water is splashing up on them. It's diluting their scent, their glands that are they're leaking, you know, the estrus, all that. It's diluting and washing that scent off of the does, which is why they run to the swamp. And they will run and run circles in the swamp. Keep in mind, the swamp that I sit on is probably about a good 10 to 15 acres. But I'm right on the edge of it. I, with my binoculars, I can watch it all day long. And you'll hear the bucks grunting. You'll hear them crashing. You'll hear them splashing. And she'll come out, and she'll go right back in another trail, right back into that swamp. I've seen that year after year after year. 
excuse me. And I never really picked up onto it until I actually sat on the edge of a swamp and started watching it. And I sat there right. because it's a pinch point between a thicket and a swamp. There's a little river there that I go up. It's about four foot deep, three to four foot deep at the deepest. And they're crossing. There was a big trail crossing it. So I'm like, oh, this is a good place to set up. I'm going to go put a, a chain on up here. And I did it. It was right on the edge of the swamp, literally maybe 12 yards from the edge of the swamp, Phragmites. And the first year I did it, this is probably seven or eight years ago back there. Yeah, probably seven or eight years ago. I watched these does coming in the swamp just being chased, just being chased. And I could just watch them all morning long just being chased back and forth, round and round. And I started thinking, and this is year after year after year, I started thinking, why are they doing it? The only thing that makes sense is because they're not going to bed down in a swamp. They're not going to bed down in water. The only thing that I can come up with is they're trying to wash that scent off of them. Yeah. That's my philosophy. Yeah. I mean, it, no charge. It may- <laughs> well, this, as I was hoping, this has been really interesting and uh i'm i'm definitely going to be trying some of this stuff right because like we said if, if if it gives you a little bit of an edge and especially with natural stuff right it doesn't cost you any money right just grab a few sprigs of goldenrod or something on yeah. your way to your stand yep and if it gives you that little extra edge why not right right the only i've only had one bad experience with it <clears throat> excuse me uh, early season, you know, it's warmer weather, goldenrod, you know, it's f- uh, full of flowers and pollen, right? So the bees go to the, to the flower and the pollen. So this is probably this is a couple of years back. I grabbed a handful, threw it in my pocket, and about a minute later, I'm walking to my stand. I'm, I started getting stung. Well, there was a oh. yellow jacket on the sprig that I threw in my pocket. Oh. So I just basically <laughs> threw the yellow jacket in my pocket. He started stinging. <laughs> Yeah, so I tell everybody, if you're going to do this, shake it off super quick, just to make sure. Yeah. Because it's not fun getting stung. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Mark, I want to thank you again for, for taking time to come and, and sort of share this information, share this knowledge with us in the audience. And do you have any uh, closing thoughts you want to leave the audience with? Oh, I'll give you one of a million. Get a child outside. Res- respect everybody. Don't be afraid to open up a door for somebody at a store or at a restaurant. And appreciate what God gave us. I like it. Plain and simple. Is- Getting back to what people used to be. I like it. I like I it. I appreciate it, man. That's a that's a good way to end it. And uh, like I said, thank you and and. Good luck this season. Yeah, you guys as well. And keep up the great work. Man. I, I love your guys' shows. Awesome. We appreciate that. All right. So that's going to be it for this week. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully there was something in there that, that maybe you can try this year and maybe give you some more confidence in the woods. Hopefully you've been doing some hunting. Hopefully you've had some success. And hopefully you're having fun. Don't take this stuff too seriously. It's supposed to be fun. So with that, I would encourage you guys to follow us on social if you're not already doing that. We're Ohio Huntsman on Facebook and Ohio Huntsman underscore podcast on Instagram. We're doing our best to, to share relevant, useful information on there and, you know, kind of fun whatever's happening in our stories on there. So if you're looking for that kind of content, check it out. And I just want to thank you all for listening. Mm-hmm.